Push it back up to verse 5 just so you get it. It is through him that we've received grace, God's unmerited favor, and our apostleship to promote obedience to the faith. So we don't just receive faith, but we need to obey the faith. And make disciples for his name's sake among all the nations. And this includes you, called of Jesus Christ and invited as you are to belong to him. I love the cool stuff that the Amplified Bible brings out. He calls us as we are. Don't ever think that you have to get good enough to have a relationship with Jesus. I think a lot of people that are living outside of fellowship with God, think they've got all these things in their life they need to get straightened out before they can have a relationship with God, and you can't straighten them out without God. So He accepts you as you are, but He doesn't want you to stay the way you are. Amen? So that means that the moment that we receive Christ, we step out onto a lifetime journey. A journey where we continually grow in right behavior. When we receive Christ as our Savior, He makes us right with Him. Righteousness, God's righteousness is placed in our spirit. His holiness, His perfection, the fruit of the Spirit, His goodness, hope, joy, peace, all of those things, if you're a Christian, are in you. And now we have to learn how to live inside out. They come to us as seeds, all those wonderful things. And we have to learn how to work with the Holy Spirit, watering those seeds with the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. Learning how to let the Holy Spirit deal with us in our lives. And then little by little, from glory to glory, day after day, our behavior improves. It is vitally important before you try to do anything about your behavior that you know who you are in Christ. Now I want to say that again. It is vitally important before you really try to do anything about your behavior. It does not do you one ounce of good to receive Christ as your Savior and then just try to change yourself for the next 20 years. Because all you're going to be is frustrated and frustrated and more frustrated because God will not let you do anything apart from Him. First, you have to learn who you are in Christ. You need to study the love of God. You need to get rooted and grounded in the love of God. I mean, you need to know that you know that you know that you know that God loves you. So that nothing can ever take that from you. You need to understand righteousness. And righteousness is, first of all, a condition that God places us into by His grace he makes us right with Himself. He actually makes us holy. He perfects us in spirit. God will never ask us to do something that He doesn't give us the ability to do. So God is not going to ask you to have right behavior without first making you right on the inside. It would be like somebody demanding that I give them water when I have no water. You cannot give somebody something that you don't have. Now, it's very important the kind of relationship we have with ourselves, Because once again, you can't give away something you don't have. So if you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. If you don't respect yourself, you won't respect anybody else. God loves us. He wants us to receive that love, learn how to love ourselves in a balanced way, then let that love flow through us. We need to have goals, and I believe our number one goal should be to love people. I really believe that's what it's all about. One new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Now, the Bible tells us to be perfect. And let's look in Matthew 5, 48 in the Amplified, what that actually says. Because when I used to read it in the King James, it would just scare me. And I'm not saying the King James is scary, but I needed to understand more what that meant. Be perfect. It's like, God, I am trying. And every day, I mess up. 
Then I'd read it again, be perfect. And I'd like, I'm trying. I guess I'll get up and try harder today. And then at the end of that day, I'd go to bed and feel like a failure and a big mess. Anybody been there, done that? But Matthew 5, 48 helps me understand it. You, therefore, must be perfect. And this is what it means to be perfect. Growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character. Now, we don't really have to pay any attention to anything there except the growing word. Growing. We're not grown, we're growing. And we will be growing until Jesus comes back to get us. So I preached all, all weekend about being obedient and dealing aggressively with sin, dealing with temptation. But in no way am I telling you that you're not going to make mistakes. It's just that you can't have a sloppy attitude toward making mistakes. And that's where I think if, if, the, if the grace, mercy, God loves you message gets out of balance with the obedience message, then all of a sudden, we're not putting forth the effort to cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it by yourself, but God's gonna, not going to do it for you without your cooperation. God sends us a divine partner when we receive Christ. Because there's something that He wants to, to work out of us. He puts it in us, but we need help getting it from in us to out of us where it can do somebody else some good. Hey, it's great that you're saved and going to heaven, but there's a whole bunch of people around you going to hell. And they're not going to believe a thing you say if you still got really bad, unloving, ungracious behavior. So our behavior is very, very, very important. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we don't have to go to some of these scriptures, says that as we continue, continue, continue in the Word. You've got to love the Word. You need to study the Word. You need to listen to the Word. As you continue in the Word of God, you see His image. And you are continually being. It's an ongoing work. You are continually being transformed into His image from one degree of glory to another. From glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. So let me just tell you right now, if you're not where you need to be this morning, just get over it. At least you're not where you used to be. Amen? But we're never going to just say, oh, well, God accepts me as I am. Yeah, He accepts us as we are, but He, wants, he doesn't want us to stay the way we are. Every single person needs to be working with the Holy Spirit to have better behavior and a closer relationship with God. Amen. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter every day. Can you look back to last year and say, I've improved from last year. My behavior is improving. I'm more patient. I'm more giving. I'm less selfish. God is definitely working in me. We should all be able to do that. But what the devil wants to do is come along every morning and remind you of how far you have to go and what you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. And so you need to know who you are so when he tells you what you're not, you can tell him who you are. You got to learn to talk back to the devil. That's what this little book called The Secret Power of Speaking God's Word Out Loud is all about. This will help you learn how to talk back to the devil. The Word of God is a sword. And when you learn how to speak it in faith out of your mouth, things begin to change. Now... I know we're familiar with these scriptures if you've been in the Word of God very long, but I, nonetheless, I want us to go look at what Paul said this morning in Philippians 3, the very well-known verse, letting go of what lies behind and pressing on to the good things that are ahead. Philippians 3, 11 through 14. Paul said that if possible, I might attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. And he's talking about, you know, not being a deadhead, deadbeat, like everybody else in the world, but to live in that resurrection power. Now he says, not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on. Everybody say, I press on. I press on. 
to lay hold of, grasp, and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize that God is calling us to win. So in these few verses, we see I press, I strain, and I press again. So even though it is the work of God that's done in us and we can do nothing apart from His help and His grace, the Bible teaches us plainly in Galatians 3 that we did not save ourselves, we did not receive the Spirit of God through works. How can we hope to perfect ourselves any way other than through the work of the Holy Spirit? Nonetheless, there is a cooperating effort. The Holy Spirit is not going to come and study your Bible for you every day. The Holy Spirit is not going to arrange your schedule where you have time to pray and study the Word. You had to make a decision to come here today. You had to make a decision, and you had to put out the effort to do that. Now, I'm sure that if everybody that God prompted to come would have been obedient to Him, they would be out the doors, lined up down the streets. But you see, not everybody does what God tells them to. Matter of fact, it would probably be very pathetic if we understood the number of Christians who do what God tells them to compared to those who don't. Can anybody say amen? amen. So now, we're made right with God through Christ. And I want us to look at another group of scriptures. I'm taking a little time here to build a foundation because I want you to understand that you are going to have to work at this. You cannot get into works of the flesh, but you are going to have to work with God. And there's a difference. So Philippians 2, back a couple of pages if you're in your Bible. They're going to be up on the screen. 12 and 13. I very rarely read this scripture in its entirety in a service because in the Amplified, it is just long, long, long. But I think it's worth taking the time to look at it. Therefore, my dear ones... As you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now, not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent, and that's what I want to say to you today. You can sit here and clap at everything I say and say amen at all the right places, and I'm glad that you're enthusiastic, but I'm going to leave here in less than an hour, and I want to know that next week, when nobody is cheering you on, that you're going to still be just as enthusiastic about following God and doing what He wants you to do. And see, this is, this is where we have the problem. We behave okay in the meeting. It's when we get home. Come on. Now, some of you have already got your, your mind set for disaster because you've traveled and you've left instructions with your spouses and your kids about how you expect to find things when you get back. And you've already made a plan. If I walk in that front door, And that house is a mess. And those kids didn't do their homework. I am going to have a fit. Well, isn't that going to be a great testimony <laughs> of your weekend in the Word? Amen? I'm not suggesting that you don't bring correction where it needs to be, but you got to be careful how you think. Amen? Because you got to go home. And I can't promise you that everything at home is going to be any different than it was when you left. I know that's a little bit of a bummer, but I might as well tell you the truth. But I can promise you this, you will be different. You will be different. And God is not nearly as interested in changing your circumstance as He is in changing you. Because when the circumstance you have is done, there will be another one right on its heels. Might as well tell you the truth. But as God changes us and we're empowered by His Spirit, I'm telling you the stuff that used to just bother us and aggravate us and get us upset for days, we, don't, it, we just don't even pay attention to it. So He says, not only when I'm there do I want you to be enthusiastic, but I want you when you go home to keep being enthusiastic. 
Now he says, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling self-distrust with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking what, from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. I mean, we got a big job. Amen? Now, work out your own salvation doesn't mean that you get salvation by works. It means that you cooperate with the Holy Spirit to let what God has done in you be worked out through you so people can see it. But I love verse 13, and not in your own strength. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's where I was trapped for so long in religion. I was trying to be good. Trying to have some sense of worthiness and, and righteousness. And what good news it was when I found out that I was put in right standing with God by His grace. I didn't have to work for that. That He loved me all the time on the not so good days and the good days. And I don't try to obey God to get Him to love me. I obey God because He loves me. To show that I love Him. This obedient lifestyle that I'm talking about is the one one and only real true way that we can show God that we love Him. Did you hear me? Worship is cool. Sitting in meetings is cool. We need all that. But you got to get it behind closed doors at home, in the marketplace, on your job, in your schools, in your neighborhoods. And the only way that we can really prove that we love God is if we let the Holy Spirit control our behavior. Come on. I'm preaching better than you're acting. It's very important that you have this thing about who you are straight because very often we have a reproach left on us from what the world has done to us. And if you were to go into Joshua chapter 5 before they went in and took the, the town of Jericho, God had to do something. He said, today, the reproach of Egypt is rolled off of you. Now, the word reproach, you may not even know what it means, but you need to. It means shame, blame, disgrace, disapproval, and a disrespectful attitude toward yourself. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't feel too good about myself after my dad sexually abused me for about 15 years. I mean, I thought I was a worthless piece of trash. I halfway felt like it was my fault and didn't understand all that and felt unloved and used and abused and misused. And my mom didn't really know what to do about it, so she did nothing. So then I felt abandoned. And then I married the first guy that came along because I thought nobody would ever want me. And he mistreated me for another five years. And I'm telling you, by the time Dave Meyer fell in love with me supernaturally as an act of God, <laughs> and I'm really not joking about that. We had five dates and got married. I mean, I know that God had us get married before he could figure out what he was getting. <laughs> he had one of those moments that you see about in the romance movies. The first time he saw me, he knew that I was the girl he wanted to marry. It had to be an act of God because I was a smart aleck from the get-go. But I was just a miserable mess. Well, Dave's a good Christian guy, spirit-filled, loves God, got a lot of good godly character, and so obviously, you know, we going off to church every Sunday. <laughs> and I was sincere. I mean, I took catechism classes, and I joined the church, and, you know, I did everything that you were supposed to do, but I was still a mess. You know why? Because you got to have more than doctrine. I took all these classes and I learned about good doctrine. I mean, I knew about the Holy Spirit. I knew about the virgin birth. I knew about the Trinity. I knew about the Lord's Supper. I knew about baptism. I knew about all of those things. I understood the blood of Christ. And I got a really good foundation about grace. But I needed to know how to get out and live in society. I needed to have a good relationship with myself. And I never heard a message like that. I never heard a message that told me who I was in Christ and that I didn't have to live under the reproach of that shame, blame, 
junk from the world. Amen? Amen. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a strong and a loud voice in heaven saying, Now it has come, the salvation and the power and the kingdom, the dominion, the reign of our God, and the power, the sovereignty, the authority of his Christ the Messiah. Why? Because the accuser of the brethren who keeps bringing charges against God's elect has been cast out. Has been cast out. So when does power come into our lives? When we finally say, no devil, I am not living under condemnation. I'm not going to constantly be taking an inventory of everything I'm not. God knew what I was not when he called me into relationship. God is not surprised by our behavior. Amen? I love that. The power doesn't come till the accuser of the brethren is cast out. Some of you are wondering why this thing is not working for you and why there's no power and you're constantly defeated. But you got to get a revelation on, on this in Revelation 12, 10, that the power doesn't come until you stop living under condemnation. But now on the other hand, you do have to receive conviction. And you have to love it. And you need to pray for it. Conviction is the Holy Spirit letting you know in your heart that your behavior stinks. I don't have a lot of time. I'm going home in a little bit. We're going to cut to the chase here. <laughs> Conviction is the Holy Spirit saying, not necessarily in words, but it's a feeling you get in here that you know you are not doing what you should be doing. Now that's our signal to repent and turn around real quick and go in the right direction. It's almost like the red light when you're driving in traffic. Or no, let's say the yellow light. Come on now, how many of you run the yellow lights? Might give you a little indication of how you are with God. I don't know, but... Come on now. The Holy Spirit is like the caution light in our life. You're going along, you got a green light, everything's fine. Now you start having some stinking behavior and here comes a yellow light. If you do your relationship with God like you do your driving, you're probably in a hurry and just think, oh, I can make it through this. And that's what causes a lot of wrecks. <laughs> Come on now. Amen. And furthermore, I believe when you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit that you should celebrate. I think you should rejoice and be so happy that you can feel that. I don't think we understand the wonderful gift that conviction is. I tell you what, I don't get by with nothing. And the longer I serve God, the more sensitive I become to wrong behavior. The quicker I get that. And that's what should happen. You know, there are things now that I am seriously convicted about that 20 years ago I wouldn't have recognized at all. Not at all. And that means you're growing. When you have understanding of how much God loves you, it helps you to be able to tell the difference between the true conviction of the Holy Spirit in letting us know that we're doing something that He wants us to change, and the condemnation of the devil, which simply just makes us feel bad about ourselves. Conviction always lifts us out of something condemnation presses us down into it. And I really want you to know the difference. Today we're offering a new product that I believe is going to be a blessing to you. It's called Taste and See. And you know, the Bible says that we need to taste and see the goodness of God. It's a four CD series and a booklet, and I think it's really going to help you in your walk with God. 
treat yourself to God's goodness every day and discover how to celebrate your progress in life. God's excited when we make progress in any area, and we should be too. Taste and see that the Lord is good with Joyce's four-CD series, Taste and See, which includes a booklet of positive reminders and scripture. It's available today for your gift of $25 or more. To order, call us toll-free at 1-800-727-9673 or visit us at JoyceMeyer.org. I had this strong relationship with the Lord, and I knew divorce was not an option. I knew that it was an inside job. It, only God could change it. And I'd go off sometimes and cry and pray and, you know, on, in specific situations that, I, that were happening. And it's amazing how the next day the thing would change. The Joyce Meyer Ministries Conference Tour. I absolutely am loving it. It's amazing. It's a blessing. How many of you want some stability in your life? You're tired of the up and down emotionally and all over the place. She's just so genuine, authentic. The Joyce Meyer Ministries Conference Tour is coming to San Jose, California, October 11th, 12th, and 13th at the HP Pavilion with worship by Jesus Culture. Then Tampa, Florida, October 25th, 26th, and 27th with worship by Fused Worship. Admission is free and open to everyone. It's for guys, too. It's just a great atmosphere here. I really feel like I'm a part of it. Your worst day with God it is still better than your best day ever was without it. For more information and a complete conference lineup, visit us online at JoyceMeyer.org or call toll-free 1-866-C-JOYCE. Don't make me come out there and get you. If I had to do one more thing around here... I'm going to go completely insane. Have you ever really listened to the...